Welcome to episode 348 of the Shared Security Podcast. And this week, we're going to be talking about two hot topics going on right now in the world of cybersecurity and privacy. First, Discord has announced that all audio and video calls will now use end-to-end encryption. So we'll talk about that development and why that's a good thing, but also why you should still be careful when you are using Discord. So that'll be fun. And then in our Aware Much segment, Scott is back to talk about LinkedIn's recent screw up where everyone was automatically opted in and actually still is opted in, by the way, Mm -hmm. to allow them to use your data to train generative AI models. How dare they? I know. It's almost like we've talked about this before, but not about LinkedIn. Yeah, we'll have things to say about that. Yeah, we will. So joining me this week for these topics and more is my co-host, Mr. Scott Wright. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everybody. Good to be back. Yeah, Scott was globetrotting around the world on vacation. Apparently, yeah. Allegedly. But he did come back. Unfortunately, that's the negative thing about vacations, right? You, they do end. They do end, yes. <laughs> Unless you're on a permanent vacation, which is called retirement. Yeah. But Scott's not there yet. Not quite. Not quite. Yeah. Maybe so, further than Tom is. Who knows? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I think we're all thinking about that at, at our age. So yeah. uh, let's jump into this week's story, which is Discord's new end-to-end encryption for audio and video, and they've called it Dave. So they, Hello, they've Dave. even given it a name, a name, the Dave protocol. And first of all, the, the big thing to note is that I like it when companies like Discord actually go through the vetting with a third party security firm to essentially validate the security of something as important as end end encryption. So they hired this firm called Trail of Bits, which right. is a really well known security consulting firm. I've known to them for a long time. They do really good work. And so they've basically released a report showing that this is in fact secure. So it went through a a thorough audit. They've actually open sourced some of the code as well that this protocol uses. So that's always a good thing. Yeah. You know, things are open sourced. So So I have a question. Yeah. Do you think there are people out there that don't know what Discord is? There might be. So let's explain. Yeah to our audience what Discord is. So Discord is an interesting, let's call it like a messaging chat application that started as a chat tool that was used by gamers. Yeah, that's where I've heard of it most. I'm not a Discord user myself. Yeah, Um, yep, exactly. So if you were playing an online game with one of your friends, you could fire up Discord and you can create a server, essentially, that you can chat and interact with your friends playing the game. It was like making up for the lack of internal chat in a lot of these online games. And then it became popular with streamers and more in the gaming community. And what's interesting about Discord is evolved past gaming now. And there's actually... I hate to say it, but there's actually businesses that are using it and people are using it just like they do with Slack and Microsoft Teams and Zoom because you can do video chat, you can do audio chat. I wasn't actually aware even that you could do audio and Mm -hmm. video chat. And I guess the purpose of this story is in dealing with securing the audio and visual or video channels that people may be using. So it's basically supporting live calls the same way Slack and Zoom and Teams do, but now with more security, right? Yeah. And that's always a good thing. How does it compare with those other live audio platforms? And is this development in terms of security, who's that going to benefit? I think it, it does put it on the same level as Zoom and Teams and the other players in this audio video conferencing space, which is a good thing. It also is now similar to Signal in a way, even though I'd say that Discord isn't quite, it has a lot more capabilities than Signal. Signal is like what we recommend for secure messaging and even phone calls, audio and video. That's all end-to-end encrypted on Signal. Mm. But now it's also the same on Discord. And so 
I say this is significant more for the younger generation that uses Discord now as a tool to communicate with their friends. So I've seen my kids, for example, they're older, they're in their 20s, but they use Discord quite a bit when they're not just for gaming, but for communicating with their friends. And I think for that generation, like the the Gen Zs, (laughs) if you will, this should be a message that you can now communicate more securely using Discord, which is a good thing. So prior to this, was it just unencrypted stuff? Any man in the middle could pick it up? Is that the idea? Uh, Yeah, that's correct. It was all unencrypted. Of course, the attack to do that is not easy to pull off. Like we always say, if you're targeted by a nation state, you may have your communications intercepted (laughs) if you're using Discord. Um, Now that is going to be much, much more difficult. Um, And the other thing I want to say about this too, though, is messages that you send on Discord. So if you're on a Discord server and you're chatting with somebody through text, through just typing on your keyboard, those messages are still unencrypted. Right. So that's very important for people to understand that it's only audio and video calls yeah. that are encrypted. So you got to be careful saying it's almost as good as Signal because Signal encrypts all the right. text. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So very different in that use case. But nonetheless, it's good. I'm glad they went through third-party vetting of their protocol. And I think it's, and of course they talked about in the blog post, we'll link in the show notes that they do have a bug bounty program. They do open source pieces of this protocol to the security community for review. So all very good things and what I would expect from a, a company doing these types of things. Excellent. Are you still relying on outdated managed file transfer tools? In today's world, the security of your sensitive data is more critical than ever. Introducing KiteWorks, the most secure and modern managed file transfer platform available. KiteWorks is audited yearly and continuously monitored by certified third-party assessors with an ongoing bounty program, regular penetration testing, and one-click appliance updates. KiteWorks minimizes vulnerabilities like no other. Many traditional MFT solutions can't compare to the level of security and functionality KiteWorks provides. But that's not all. KiteWorks offers a world-class secure file sharing and email platform. Easily send automated or ad hoc files through fully integrated shared folders and email. Administrators can manage policies in a unified console and create custom integrations with their comprehensive REST API. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. All right, Scott, are you ready for a segment we haven't had in quite a while? Just holding like my call. screen still, so I... Yes, okay. Aware much? Yes, Tom, it's time to help our audience become much more aware. As you mentioned up front, LinkedIn is in the spotlight for how it's using its users' data to train its AI models. As you can imagine, the biggest social media platforms have a wealth of data that could be used to train LLMs or large language models. But LinkedIn jumped the gun and apparently overstepped not only its privacy policy, but it did it without telling users at all about what it was. They've now taken a step back and they've updated their privacy policy and provided a way to opt out, but it's still causing a lot of red flags for people. I always assumed that LinkedIn, like every other social media platform, was training their algorithms with user data already, which is, I'm sure, true. But I don't think most people realize what's different and what the risks might be when they take the extra step of feeding user data into large language models. Does that sound like a reasonable question, Tom? I think so, absolutely. And this is not the first time we've seen this type of thing happen. I think more and more companies are using your data for, to train their AI models. But the problem with this one is that they're doing it by opting you in automatically. You don't really get a choice. You can turn it off, but by enabling this for, I don't know how many users LinkedIn has, millions Mm -hmm. of people, they've collected a lot of data up front before people got a chance. But haven't they been doing that all the time anyway? That's the issue here. 
is they didn't state that in their privacy policy. And until people asked after- surely their privacy policy six up to six months ago mm-hmm. said we can use your data, we can sell your data, etc. But yes, but they didn't specifically call out that they're using it to train their AI. Right. Model. So I guess the question I have is, how much worse can it be <laughs> than the way it was before? It depends on your perspective of it, right? The it depends on how the LLM that they're using is secured. We've seen lots of instances of data being manipulated out of these LLMs or harvested in different ways because of security vulnerabilities. And I think the fact that people just don't want their information going into these giant LLM engines that one day, who knows how their data might be used in the future. Mm -hmm. It comes down to consent. Yeah, I guess for me, it's as a black box either way. I haven't always assumed the worst was going to happen to any data that I put there. (laughs) We've always talked about you can't assume just because your privacy settings are set to not show things to people. One day that may have a bug in it or maybe breached or disclosed Mm -hmm. somehow. I understand that. So I think maybe they'll be making deeper inferences about your behavior than they could have otherwise, or maybe you could have less anonymity when you thought you, you did. Those are the things that I imagine. And perhaps nobody really knows exactly. It's like in the Social Dilemma uh, movie, the people who designed the algorithms for Facebook and Google don't really know exactly how they work anymore and what they're doing. But the one thing I noticed is when Rachel Toback suggests opting out, I'm going to listen to her. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I'd say most people in the security community are recommending opting out because I think to your point, Scott, like we don't know what is going to happen to this data in the future. And we've seen the power of AI and especially how it can correlate things together. Imagine if LinkedIn happens to take the data that they've collected through AI and sells it to a data broker to match even more information about your habits, your how you use a social network. Yes. It's endless. And with the possibilities. even worse, I'm just imagining worst cases now that we're talking about even worse, <laughs> maybe incorrectly, like maybe yes. incorrect data. Exactly. Because we know that people post all kinds of not factual data <laughs> on LinkedIn. <laughs> but also the fact that LLMs are notorious for hallucinating and yes. getting things wrong. So That's right. That's right. Yeah, I definitely recommend opting out. In fact, I'm going to share my screen just because I want people to see, yeah, just to just how to do it really Perfect. quick, because I think it's important for everybody to see this. So if you go into your settings and then you go under data privacy, mm-hmm. there is this data for generative AI improvement. So if you click that, you will unfortunately see this set to on. Yeah. I have mine turned off because I followed the advice from Rachel Toback and <laughs> other experts in this area and so you just turn that off and and you're done but that is that's what's angering most people about this is that you're opted in and it's not the first time that companies have done things like this and uh, this is a new precedent you are just going to be automatically opt into these things and the article i link in the show notes talks about at least in the united states There is no federal privacy law to change or by law say companies can't do this. Mm -hmm. I know it's different across the world. In fact, I know there's countries in Europe and that have basically prevented LinkedIn from even collecting any data for AI usage, which I think is interesting to point out because they do have these more broad privacy laws. So that's really interesting. Love to hear from people if they can post in our YouTube channel, their thoughts about this stuff. I think there are always different perspectives, maybe even we don't think of to thank people for participating that way. But this segment of Aware Much was brought to you by ClickArmor, the employee cyber confidence builder. And ClickArmor has a growing library of interactive gamified lessons and assessments that can really help with engagement of employees to build confidence in their cyber skills. I was recently speaking with a CEO of a cyber tech company who is a customer of ours and has worked with multiple cybersecurity training companies. And he said, after taking ClickArmor's training, he feels like by far, hands down, it's the best he's seen, which was a a great compliment. So when we get that kind of feedback, we're pretty confident that we can help any organization build a stronger, more confident security culture. So visit clickarmor.ca and get a free trial to see how quickly your team can be engaged and preventing cybersecurity attacks. 
that's it for this installment of Aware Much. Thank you, Scott. Good to have you back. Miss the wear much. And it's good we have to, to get, be back. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get Kevin back so he can laugh hysterically over my. Yeah, that's the only thing missing. I, I know he is unfortunately cannot join us this week because he's out at InfoSec World and he's got Gurkhan at the end of the week. So he is back to traveling, but it was good to have him for uh, the last couple episodes. Amazing. All right. So I think that's all we have time for today, but thank you, Scott. Thanks, Tom. Welcome Thanks, back. everybody. And until next time, stay safe, stay secure, and stay private. Thanks for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts, follow us on X at SharedSec, and help support the podcast by joining our Patreon to get ad-free episodes, bonus content, and many more exclusive supporter-only benefits. Visit sharedsecurity.net slash supporter for more details.